meet again at last. The circle is now complete. What's the world coming to? Well, you got a problem with what I did, Anthony? Oh, no, hey, no. Fucking rat anyway. So family's all rats. Could have brought to be a rat. Gee, I'm real sorry your mom blew up, Ricky. Now you're gonna dig the fucking thing. You're gonna dig the hole. You're gonna do it. I got no fucking line. You're gonna do it. Fuck this. I think the fucking hole. I don't give a fuck. I realized that what was living behind that boy's eyes was pure and simple. Jesus Christ. Mister, you okay in there? Ah, put some vintage coffee around here someplace. Have you any idea what the cost of your actions is? What their effect might be? Oh, you to give them hope. What do you give them? We give them happiness. And they give us authority. Welcome everybody to the Cinefellas Podcast. It's July 28th, 2017. This is Chris coming to you live from the library. As always, on behalf of Cinefellas.com, the only place for all your Cinephilic needs. Today's episode is brought to you by one of my favorite podcasts that just got up and running called Socially Rockward. It's hosted by my good friend, Rob Jesse. Socially Rockward is comedian and rapper Rob Jesse's attempt to figure out why he's so socially awkward. He does it by talking with other comedians and creative types from all walks of life about their experiences and their anxieties. So far, Rob has three episodes up episode two of which features Bobby V, a good friend of this podcast. Now you'll remember that we had Bobby on the June 1st edition of this show, and since then he's experienced some health issues. So right now I just want to take a moment and wish Bobby well. You can hear him talk more about his health struggle and how it influenced his return to comedy, which only came about two weeks ago, on episode two of Socially Rockward. And if you love it so much, like I think you will, and you stick around till episode three, you're going to hear me having a great conversation with Rob. You know, we talk a little bit about art, um, but, you know, we get into also a heavy conversation about how depression and anxiety leads to creativity, but also how to sort of cope with that struggle in the real world, right, during um, individual interactions. So I was really excited to be a guest on the show, and I hope we can organize a chat with Rob coming on here ASAP. So download Socially Rockward on iTunes today. That's Socially, R-A-W-K-W-A-R-D. You know, math, it's very simple. It's just R for Rob and awkward. R plus awkward equals rockward. That's Socially Rockward. Check it out on iTunes today. You'll learn a little bit about yourself and how you interact in social situations along the way. All right, let's get to the show, shall we? episode of the Cinepalace podcast, I'm chatting with Irish director Brendan Muldowney about his new film, Pilgrimage. So Pilgrimage premiered earlier this year to acclaim at the Tribeca Film Festival in New York City. The film, set in 13th century Ireland, tells the story of a small group of monks who begin a reluctant pilgrimage across an island torn between centuries of tribal warfare and the growing power of Norman invaders to help deliver a sacred Christian relic to Rome. Their travels become increasingly dangerous, leading the monks to question the meaning of faith. It stars Tom Holland, John Berthnall, and Richard Armitage. Brendan and I chatted about a number of interesting topics, 
You know, on this podcast, I talk to a lot of American independent filmmakers and people dealing with the big studio system. But in Ireland, they have the nationalized Irish Film Board that approves content and helps filmmakers achieve funding. So the first thing I really wanted to know from Brendan was about this process. We also discuss Matthias, who, if you only vaguely recall him as I did, Matthias is the 13th apostle, which very few, few people remember. He was the one who replaced Judas. He's this sort of overlooked character in the Bible, but he plays a central role in the story of pilgrimage. I really wanted to dig deep and talk with Brendan about the central philosophical questions in the film as well. And for me, the most important question was whether or not suffering and sacrifice have to take place in order to prove one's religious faith. Moreover, where are those lines between organized religious practice and spirituality? Now, my conversation with Brendan really made me reflect on my own life. You know, I went to Catholic school till about sixth grade, and I did the whole baptism and confession thing, but I left before confirmation. So, no, I can't get married in a Catholic church. Sorry, I know that, you know, my core demographic of appeal is Catholic women, and I just lost them completely right there. Well, my decision to leave Catholic school caused a lot of tension with my father's side of the family because they were very, very religious. They grew up practicing Catholics and I grew up practicing with them up until that point. My mom and stepdad, however, supported my decision to go to public school. And I was fine overall, you know, with that decision. I had no qualms uh, about leaving the world of uniforms and religious learning behind. Why did I get out? Well, for me, I had a problem with people telling me what to think. I mean, I think that was part of my own personality. Um, but every time I'd ask a question, I'd get criticized. So more than even being someone who likes to challenge authority, for me, it was more about this personal issue of don't stop me from being curious. You know, I'm naturally inclined to be curious. I want to know about everything. And just because you want to know something, just because you want to be educated about something, that doesn't mean that you're criticizing it or trying to tear it down. You just kind of want to know about the parameters around it. And I think the most interesting argument in this vein that also comes from a religious context is um, St. Augustine. Is it St. Augustine or St. Thomas More? I'm not quite sure, but the argument is that God only allows, oh, Thomas Aquinas, I believe that's St. Thomas Aquinas. Um, the argument is that God only allows evil to exist in the world so that you have a reference point for understanding good. In other words, if all of the world was good, then you would never recognize it as anything positive because it would always just be there. It would be ubiquitous and we'd take it for granted. Um, Kind of in that same vein, I think that you need to test all ideas to see their opposite, to gain reference, but also to see, you know, sort of how they can be tested and used and applied. Because I'm a person that believes you should question your faith as well in anything to test its strength. I mean, it's not just a religious context that we can apply this idea to. Uh, politics, for example, is another one. But let me be clear, I'm in no way trying to demean anyone that practices an organized religion, um, but I am a big believer in an individual's spiritual relationship with themselves and the world around them. My grandmother was a staunch believer in her Catholic God for her entire life. She acted as a sacristan, and for those of you that don't know, in the, in the Catholic Church, a sacristan is someone who will go into the sacristy, which is the little room where the priest goes before mass, he puts on the robe, he gathers the Bible, the water and wine are back there. So my grandmother, uh, every day after school, when I would go to her classroom, we would go from the classroom into the sacristy and she would prepare the, you know, pour the water and wine into the individual containers for the next mass, usually it would be the next morning. Um, and then she would lay out the robes depending on the season or depending on the religious holiday. So she served as a sacristan for most of her life. And she also gave her life to teaching at a Catholic school. My grandmother was one of the lay teachers who, and lay meaning um, not a nun, one of the lay teachers at my school. 
and she would also function as the vice principal. Now that's, you know, you gain a lot of respect doing that because you are, as a lay teacher, you know, you, you don't have that added benefit of being a nun where you sort of have a certain degree of respect in the community. I mean, that's not to say that lay teachers are disrespected in the community, but for my grandmother to be awarded the role of vice principal, you know, it shows you kind of her devotion to the church and a religious way of living. Then she had a stroke in 2009, right around Mother's Day, and I watched her completely fall apart because she felt her God deserted her. That experience showed me that it's fine to have faith, but if you put all your faith in the concept of God and none in yourself, ultimately you're going to be alone. She felt that God completely, you know, she dedicated her life to serving him and when he needed her most that she was betrayed. But that concept of detachment, having faith in yourself, that's what ultimately drew me to Buddhism. But hey, I mean, that's another story for another time. Well, I hope that you see a little bit of my takeaway when you see pilgrimage. Um, I'm open to all ideas and I want to know what you think too. If your religious practice is working for you, I'm sincerely happy. And I mean that. Take all these ideas into your head and heart as you listen to my conversation with Brendan Muldowney and I will see you on the other side. So uh, I guess we'll just jump right in since we only have 15 minutes. Sure, yeah. Okay. So uh, the first thing I wanted to ask you about is, um, you know, for a lot of the viewers and listeners on the website, um, you know, they'd probably be unfamiliar with the way that filmmaking works in Ireland. So the politics and funding structure is different because you work with the Irish Film Board. So for audiences in America, could you just describe a little bit of the differences in your process by which you had to make pilgrimage? Yes, I can. Uh, it's really a producer's question because I don't get involved too much with the fight, but um, I understand how it works. Uh, you know, the, the Irish Film Board is funded by the government and they fund both development and then if they deem a project worthy, it, it moves into production. So there's two, you know, yeah, each development round is, in, you know, you have to apply for a certain amount of funding. And if you keep getting up to each step, then, you know, they'll, say, apply for production funding. So, you know, and then, you know, we can get up to, uh, it's changed now, but it used to be up to 900 or a million, million euros. Um, and added to that, we have a tax shelter, which, again, I don't understand the certain percentages, but depending on how much money you have, you know, not just from Ireland, but from everywhere, how much you're spending in Ireland, you can add to this with the tax shelter. Um, and then most of our productions are done uh, through co-productions. Um, you know, it works quite well with other countries where their ta- their funding works with ours, and you know we can spend their money back in their country or on their actors or in post-production. So you know, it's a symbiotic relationship. Mm. So in that way, it's... and also you know, and also like with pilgrimage. You know, we, we use market money as well. So there's a certain amount of pre-sales that goes into it as well. Mm-hmm. That's cool because it's a it's a very collaborative process than what we are sort of used to. It is. Um, <clears throat> I don't know I don't know really what the difference is because I've never worked within a system where someone is putting up all the money mm-hmm. and has and is making all the decisions. You know, there's there is a lot more voices where where we come from. Mm-hmm. I don't know whether that's bad or good. It depends. Everyone's different. Every every person is different. Every situation is different. So you can keep good and bad in both. I try. Mm-hmm. Sure. I was watching a Q and A Q&A with you that you did right after Savage, and you talk about revenge films and how you want them to mean something to you or say something to you. So I was wondering, did that framework apply to you while you were making Pilgrimage? And if so, what does it mean to you? And not so much. With, with, with Savage, I was definitely trying to achieve a certain thing, which was 
I had witnessed something here with the, the troubles between in the north of, north of Ireland between the English and the Irish. I had witnessed some brutal moments and with Savage I wanted to nearly put the audience in the same position that I had felt, you know, that uh, sort of broken feeling for humanity when you witness humans being violent to each other. Um, with pilgrimage, I suppose there's like a small bit of that coming into it, but it was written with entertainment, but also, yes, there was some sort of depth to it, some intelligence to it. So in a way, the easiest way to answer that is is that it, I suppose if you're dealing, both films are dealing with violence, and I would come from the school that if there's going to be violence, uh, you're going to see the blood, because violence is messy. Um, I, I remember when I was growing up watching things like the 18, and, you know, they were great, great fun for me as a kid, but they were sanitized. You know, people would get shot and fall out of screen. And there's a lot of films that are made like that where violence is sort of, there's no consequence to it. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, I think I come from the school that it sort of, if I can, I mean, I won't, I'm, I'm sure I won't always do this, but I do like violence to have a consequence. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think that's really, that really plays out with Pilgrimage because you tell this story about, Matthias and sort of the ramifications that come after violence directed towards him, right? So what made you interested in yeah. in Matthias? Because because he's sort of this even for religious scholars or people that are regularly pl- practicing, Matthias is this kind of lesser known character in the Bible. So what made you interested in him? Well, I, it wasn't me directly. It was the writer who who came up with that, and mm-hmm. the minute he pitched me. St. Matthias, I, that was, you know, originally he hooked me with a, with a very simple story of monks traveling across Ireland in the 13th century, dragging a relic, and there's an ambush. I thought that was great, I thought there were lots of possibilities. And then he wrote the, the treatment, not the script, because we had to apply for funding. Mm-hmm. And in the treatment he had, um, the relic was a stone that was used to martyr the 13th apostle, St. Matthias. And I think both me and the producer looked at each other and went, that's great. We had to look up St. Matthias. He was a real person. We were, but we were hooked. It, 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 cause you know, it, what it sounded like was, it sounded like fan, like, a fa- like some of the best fantasy films, and yet it was based in reality. So it had everything going for it. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's in- interesting because you sort of get that feeling right away because you begin in, it's about 55 AD, so it's about 20 years after Christ is murdered, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, exactly, yeah. I had to work, had to work that out, yeah. And it's interesting, too, because, you know, now, all these years later, we see, when we talk about the church or the pope, it's seen as this unified institution. But we get the sense through pilgrimage that, you know, in the 13th century, in Europe especially, the idea of what it means to be Christian within the Roman church and within the monks of Ireland's daily practice is very different. So what was your research process in kind of nailing down these differences between the, the countries? You mean in modern day or in 55? Well, just so the film, it takes place in... Modern day in the film. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, the writer, again, did, did a, a lot of the research. Um, he would have recommended some books to me on this, mm-hmm. but... Um, Sorry, just going back to 55 AD, I mean, at, at the time, we use a thing, he holds up a Christian symbol, and, and um, it escapes me the name of it now, but it's not correct. We used it just because it would be more recognizable as a cross, but what Christians used at the time were two halves of a fish, and they used to, when they'd meet, they'd put them together, and they'd know they were, because it was so close after the death of um, Jesus that they, it, it was nearly like a secret society. But of course, by the time our film starts, it's become like uh, the Catholic Church has spread across Europe. And but Ireland was still sort of on the edge. They were converted, but not converted. They did their, they did things their own way. The monks had different tonsures, which is the the haircuts. Mm-hmm. Um, like in Rome, it was like a crown. It was a sign of nobility. Whereas the Gaelic monks, the Irish monks, had started shaving their head at the front in a different way. So <clears throat> I suppose our, our research was um, 
it's quite scant the research on the Irish monks. Even those haircuts, it's very hard. There's no pictures. Mm, the sure. the vague descriptions. So we had to like come up with our own sort of thoughts about how pagan they would still be. Now, I mean, if you notice in the monastery, there's a um, there's a stone standing in the middle of it, like an ancient pagan stone. So like we definitely were playing with the fact that the Irish Catholics at that time. We're still ha- with, with one foot still in the pagan traditions. Mm-hmm. So, unlike some of your other films that are set in the present day, did your directing style change at all when you were in such a specific moment with this kind of umbrella of history over it? You know, I take each film as it comes, and, and it's and it's really the sort of tone, the tone of, of the script that's speaking to me in, in how I how I approach the style. And with Savage, it was a sort of very gritty urban film, and, and I felt it needed a sort of handheld sort of. We used a very long end style on that, and on the turn of my second film, I used a very sort of slow tracks, cranes. Uh, steady cams, everything very floaty and dreamlike. And with this one, I felt I didn't want to compete with Hollywood or the bigger television shows like Game of Thrones. And where, so I, I sort of figured, um, what would I do differently? And I thought I'd bring, try and bring some social realism to it. It also was in the back of my mind that it was going to be a very hard shoot. I had very little time to shoot compared to those bigger projects and um, those bigger films that I made. So. A handheld style was going to work for me. I could move the camera around. I could move quick. I could cover like eight close-ups in one scene. You know, in in, in a scene very quickly. But you know, ultimately, it was the idea that I was going to try and bring some social realism to it by having the camera off tripods. Mm-hmm. I also thought to myself, I don't want to use any filmmaking tools from the modern day. I don't want to use tripods, tracks, cranes, helicopters. You now that changed. In the end, I used some drone shots. But I went into it thinking I was trying to make it as basic as possible. Yeah, and I think that really comes through because there's that gritty emotional quality to it that transcends time period. Good. And then with that too, there's this sort of central question that is just as relevant today as it was then it, and it's this question of whether suffering has to occur to prove one's religious faith. So I was wondering what your personal feeling was on that question. And who, who's suffering are you, are you referring to in the film? Yeah, that's a good question, right? I mean, I think specifically, you know, thinking of, um, you know, the, the, the mute character and, and his, you know, he sort of suffered. Oh, okay. Right, he sort of sacrifices himself for the good, and he's sort of being told this whole time, like if he wants to prove himself, he has to go through this process of repentance, right? Like physical, emotional, psychological. Yeah. Well, you know, with the mute, I mean, because I thought you were going to say Brother Kieran, who's tortured at the end, because I think his yeah. he's suffering purely for fun. I have a feeling the mute is a tortured soul whose conscience is at him as much as it is. A religious conscience it's more just a human conscience it's his conscience of, of what he's done in the name of religion in the crusades and the atrocities he's committed and he just what he just wanted to leave it and when he washed up in ireland miles away from this it sort of was a nice peaceful existence there and he became friends with the novice um i don't think he's sacrificing or suffering him you know direct throughout the film necessarily for religion or for the relic. I don't think he cares anymore about the Catholic Church. I think he's doing it for his friend, for the novice. Would you say that the film makes any kind of commentary on another really important question, which is the difference between organized religious practice and spirituality? Well, absolutely, yeah. I mean, there's, you know, it's obvious that the film is is asking the hard questions of organized religion, mm-hmm. the organized religious structure, the hierarchy, you know, how it can become corrupt, how not just power, but religious power can be corrupted, how people can use fear to control, and I, I think religion does that very well, and uses fear to control. Um, so, and yet, 
you know, we tried to balance that because, you know, I don't want to attack people's faiths and, and you know, uh, uh, you know, I don't like when people use faith in the wrong way, but I don't want to attack people's faith. So I was very conscious of having the novice as a, a, a very innocent, a blank slate, someone who sees, sees God in nature and, and sees the good in things. And, and really have him come up against a political animal like the Cistercian from Rome and to see how twisted really religion can be can become. Um, and I, I don't know uh, at the end. I've left it ambiguous, but you know, it'd be nice to think that the novice is still pure of heart, as they call him, uh, during the film. Yeah, I mean, that's really a fascinating question because it keeps you, I, and I think a lot of viewers that see the film are going to feel very invested in that very part of it, right? And trying to decipher how they feel about uh, him and sort of his relationship to his own faith. And, you know, probably question, it made me think a lot about my own faith and the way that I relate to these ideas as well. So I think that was cool. Good, yeah. I mean, I think it's important. I mean, uh, to to just accept blindly, I suppose, is where you run into trouble because you know if if something's gone wrong, you have to question it. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So, in kind of wrapping all of this up, I know it's it went by fast. It's already fifteen minutes. Um, would you have any advice for young filmmakers that are you know really inspired by work you do that would like to have a career in film one day? If I'm talking to an American young filmmaker, well, you know what, it's all the same, I suppose, because if you really want to make films, you're going to make them. And mm-hmm. the answer is you don't give up, um, no matter how hard it gets or what you have to do, what you have to work to, to you know, to, to, to survive while you're trying to make films. Everyone has a different path. I would recommend trying, as making sure you, you, it's not like a backup, but it's like you learn a skill within filmmaking that is something you can do, whether it's camera or whether it's production or assistant directing or in my case, I decided a long time ago that the most important thing, and this isn't for everyone, but just for me, I decided the most important thing to try and understand was writing. So I tried to skill myself in writing and I read a lot, a lot of scripts, a lot of books, and I wrote a lot. And I'm still not a great writer, but it, it, I, I feel that, that has a, that's given me a great grounding, and I love, I love storytelling, so that's where I focused. But yeah, I, my, my advice would be to have a secondary skill. Hmm. Yeah, right, so you can be diverse, bring different perspectives. I think that's really valuable. Yeah, yeah I mean, it gives you another, another perspective on your own filmmaking as a director, but also you can earn money within filmmaking and you're still learning you're not working you know you're not waiting tables so i think i think it's good great well thank you for that that's really inspiring and i love the film i I wish you all the luck with it and i look forward to seeing what happens thank you very much we appreciate that yeah thank you and have a great day okay bye 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 So what'd you think? Brendan's a brilliant guy. I think you're going to see his passion for raising deep philosophical ideas in pilgrimage. Um, As you've heard earlier, it made me think a lot about my own life. And if you watch closely, I think it's going to make you do the same. And after you see it, I'd like to know how it influenced your way of thinking. Even if it influenced you in a negative way or maybe something you didn't agree with, I think that's a very valuable response as long as we have that conversation respectfully. So feel free, comment, add some um, thoughts to the cinefellows.com site or this post specifically for this podcast. Um, And you can, what's the date here? August 11th. So on August 11th, Pilgrimage hits theaters, VOD platforms, and digital HD. That's August 11th, 2017. And ironically, that is also the date or I should say, would have been the date of my grandmother's birthday, the one I was talking about earlier. Ooh, spooky. 
All right, Cinefeliacs, that's it for this week. Remember also to check out Rob Jesse's podcast, Socially Rockward, on iTunes now. This is Chris reminding you to share a movie with someone you love. Until next time, my friends.